Hey everybody. Good to have your company. Just gonna get ourselves dialed in here. Hope you're all having a wonderful Wednesday evening, wherever you are. I'd love you to let me know where you're all watching from. We'll try to give you a shout out wherever we can. Just gonna put you in the in the zone here a bit, so I know what I'm doing as well. A little Riley Page, Mike Menkoff as well. I just want to send a quick reminder to everybody as well that uh, next Wednesday night, you'll get the night off, okay? No Wednesdays with Wade next week because it's Thanksgiving. So I hope you'll have a, a safe and enjoyable uh, Thanksgiving uh, this year. So next Wednesday, uh, we'll be taking the night off, but back the week after. Hello to Rick Otratovic. I'm sure I said that wrong. Otratovic, I probably said that wrong. Dale Myers, Dave Cheney, uh, Braley Mason, Jay Reesberg, Marion Alexander, Daryl Elliott, wherever you might be watching. Uh, wonderful to have your company. If you could, I'd love you to, um, hello, Dustin Lansiel. Press share for me, okay? So let's get this sort of shared each time. So if you can, while we're doing this, hey, Chris Krug, one of the voices of the Knoxville Raceway. Good to see you tuned in as well. And so cool to have Chris Ish watching as well. Chris uh, joined me uh, only a couple of weeks ago on my own personal Facebook, and we just relive some of the golden days of uh, Chris racing that very cool 17E uh, back in the day as well. So wherever you're watching from, wonderful to have your company and uh, a Terry Degoe from the Knoxville Push Trucks. What would we do without you guys and gals? And Brian Mathis, always from Oskaloosa. Uh, good to see you and Michelle uh, tuned in as well. In fact, Brian and Michelle Mathis actually spent some quality time, not like what Martin Lawrence was referring to in Bad Boys, with Casey Kane Racing only last week. As a matter of fact, so uh, hey, Sean McDonald from Sydney. So uh, just want to get a couple of quick housekeeping things out of the way. If you could share this as we go, would really appreciate it. Now it's only 149 days or 148 sleeps until the season OPA. The Pella Motors Craig Ford season opener on April 17. Write it down. Exciting. Can't wait. Uh, get across the KnoxvilleRaceway.com website. Uh, spool down on the left-hand side and you'll be able to subscribe to the dirt, the dirt to the newsletter and catch all the information coming up uh, as it happens um, from there as well. Also want you to get across our Twitter, uh, the Facebook page, Instagram as well. And of course, as the Denison Racing Tees, they are doing their winter range. So you can get online, you can order uh, hoodies and jackets and caps and t-shirts and all that cool stuff. The folks at Denison's, as always, do remarkable stuff. Jamie Ball, you're a good man. He's pointed out the Methanol Moonshine shirt already. I'd love you to get across methanolmoonshinemerch.com and check out our new Ms. Methanol Moonshine range for the ladies, our active wear and stuff. We'll talk about that very soon because, hello, Brad Mason, I've got a guy hanging out in California that we need to get to. So let's do that. Let's go to California. From Mildura, Australia to California. That's how we roll here. And look at that. He's all set up already. He's in the, I'm going to say it's like in the garage or the carport or something. Hello, big cat. Good to see you, mate. Yeah, if we're talking Australian, we're in the carport. <laughs> we're in America, we're in the garage. <laughs> so, I got yes. the, the championship car from last year, the Knoxville Nationals check, and a, a cardboard cutout of uh, Casey and I from the, uh, winning the championship last year that I uh, local Napa store gave us so it's oh, kind cool. of fun, but yeah got a little shrine but we're gonna move some of that stuff over to our uh i'm building a little shop here so um nice get to put up some some more trophies and some other things so that'll be fun absolutely uh great to have your company mate just want to remind everybody to share this as they can and the guy that actually waved the flags on your 2018 knoxville nationals win is tuned in from Sioux Falls, South Dakota as well. It was always good to catch up with Doug Clark, wasn't it, Brad? Absolutely. He was uh, no BS, uh, B BS guy, but we've had a lot of fun joking around over the years, and uh, it's always fun to see him, uh, you know, around the races still. He's enjoying himself, and uh, it seems like he's having a lot of fun uh, in retirement. Mate, it's incredible to think that you and I spoke 
coming up on six months ago or so uh, when we were just trying to get the word out that, hey, we we're going to go racing. You were going to go racing at, at Knoxville. We we're doing some stuff with the Nice Energy Drink World of Outlaws Sprint Car Series to say, hey, take a deep breath, everyone. We're going racing. But it was very uncertain at that time. It's incredible to think, Brad, here we are at the end of your second consecutive World of Outlaws Championship win. For a while there, I didn't think you were going to be doing this. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, uh, it's pretty incredible, really, considering, you know, how many things were halted, uh, you know, how many professional athletes and, and different sports weren't able to even have any seasons. And, and we were still able to, to kind of gun it out for a championship and get over 50 some odd races in. So uh, hats off to the World Racing Group for that. Honestly, they, they did a lot more than I thought we could do and, you know, push the envelope in some places and, you know, put a good, uh, you know, system in place to get through you know the tougher places and and everybody stuck together and and we made it through and and honestly it was a it was a good season uh, i think everybody's ready for 2021 or or hopefully whenever the more normalcy you know uh, gets here but uh, you know the fact that we were able to to have a season is is pretty extraordinary yeah look absolutely because it was certainly very uncertain. There's no doubt about that. I think 54 races were what you were able to contest, mate. Um, and the greater majority of the guys in the top seven all managed to pull that uh, 54 win in, a result in. I think David Gravel was the only guy inside that top group that only picked up 51. I think he had those truck commitments. But, man, 54 races was a hell of a lot better than what we were facing back in June. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's uh, like I said, it's pretty crazy to think, you know, just looking at all the different – you know, sports uh, teams across the world, the country, um, you know, to see how many people lost entire seasons, lost their, you know, sources of income and things like that. So we're, we're, we're very fortunate. You know, there's no doubt about that, that we were able to get, you know, a race season in and then honestly be crowned a champion is pretty special. Yeah. And mate, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy year on any level. I mean, Logan gave you plenty to think about that's probably one of the most exciting things i think for the, the fans of the sport brad was that shark racing in particular man they just stepped up their game he's been a revelation hasn't he yeah you know and one thing i learned through this whole thing is um you know last year when i was tra trying to beat donnie i felt like i had the whole the whole fans uh with me and then uh this year since i got the one i felt like uh logan was you know obviously he's the uh, the underdog so so everybody was cheering for him and it was it was a lot of fun uh to watch how scruffy's you know trained uh, logan and uh jacob and they've they've just done such a good job bobby allen scruffy by the way for anyone that yeah. doesn't know, but uh he's he's extraordinary uh how much experience he has and, and the knowledge that he has and he takes uh you know pennies and rubs them together and, and there they are contending for a championship so hats off to those guys but um obviously my guys uh we overcame a lot of adversity and, and uh, we had our own issues throughout the season and just as anybody did, but it was nice to uh, come out on top for sure. That Logan's win in particular, um, that really stuck, struck a nerve with a lot of people. I think that was, uh, you know, something that, you know, we, we was running so strongly, but when you think back to the other the denominator in that team, what, one of the best, most widely received wins was Jacob's win. Like people, Every team seemed to have this this feeling that, damn, this is good for our sport, Brad. Yeah, absolutely. You know, whenever you see a guy work so hard and make, you know, such a commitment to something, it's really easy to bail on something three, four years into, you know, any business or anything that you're trying to achieve when you just can't do it. And, uh, you know, to see Jacob commit, you know, six or seven seasons, you know, to, to get to that point, you know, he'd come so close so many times that, you know, at that point, I think all the, you know, we're all friends out there. We all care about each other. And yeah. uh, it was neat to see him win. He's just one of the good guys. So um, I, I certainly was cheering for him that night. Um, you know, we've, we've had some good races and, uh, but I was cheering for him and, and happy to see him get that win for sure. He's just uh, so lively, such a positive guy and, and a fun guy to be around. So uh, nothing but respect for him and, and his team. And I was happy he got his first one, but you know, now, uh, now we're going to make it harder on him to get a second one. Yes. Yeah, you might not be quite as happy for his second one. Brad, you make a good point about life on the road uh, with the teams because if you're in the NBA or the NFL, you know, or, or playing hockey, um, the teams don't travel together. The team travels together, but the entire league doesn't travel together like our sport. 
So whilst you want to beat each other up on the racetrack, and I mean that if the race wins, there is a real sense of unity that you can only understand when you're on the road together. Yeah, absolutely. I kind of consider it like a fraternity, you know, uh, the people that are in it only under really understand what, what it's like, you know, and the, the, you know, the accidents that happen and the, you know, the traveling down the road when motorhomes break down and this breaks down and, you know, just the, the amount that we're all trying to move from place to place and try to accomplish those types of things. Yeah, I feel like we're a big family on those things. Now, when we get on the racetrack and, you know, it's me versus Logan or me versus Donnie or me versus anybody, uh, yeah, I want to win. And, and uh, you know, you just do what you got to do there. And we have our differences and you're always going to have your scrape ups. But at the end of the day, I think we'll all look back on these times and, and cherish these, you know, memories and, and the camaraderie between all the, the fellow racers. It's, it definitely is, you know, something we all work really hard to get to this point. And then, you know, to stay here is, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely a, a different type of lifestyle. It's, mm. you know, it's not just racing, it's, it's your life. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing you're, you're probably too young or hopefully you've seen it on YouTube, Revenge of the Nerds. Um, you just made a call about the fraternity. W what fraternity would you say that the sides boys are, um, Brad? How would you, they're not exactly lambda, 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 if you know what I mean. Um, what, what, what fraternity are the sides boys? Uh, what everyone usually gets kicked off campus about the first week of the, the year. So I don't even know if there's a name for them, but uh, yeah, they're, they're the ones that, uh, they got to be off campus about two miles and they still get kicked out of the college basically. So yeah, no, they're just, they're a lot of fun. Um, they're the, they're the life of the party. That's for sure. And, and that's probably more important than ever this year, Brad, because there had to be times when it was just hard just to be, let alone to actually go and race. You had to worry about family. You, it was hard to have that, you know, that continual connection. You had to double guess everything you were doing. So the guys like like Paul and Jason and, and TK and Gravy and those kind of guys, their role was even more important. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, making light of the situations that we were all in. Um, obviously, everything's very serious, but, you know, you still got to have a lot of fun and, and uh, you know, you got to laugh. And uh, those guys always make you laugh. So, um, you know, they were, you know, Jay was, uh, he was a lot more serious this year than normal, but yeah, you know, he's, uh, he's still a lot of fun and, uh, you know, he's, he's looking forward to another season, which is, which is crazy. He's, he's been out here a long time and, um, you know, I, I, I got to appreciate the effort that he puts in for sure. Brad, how much time do you have to really pay attention to other people's programs? Like let, let's look at Donnie, for example, Donnie, obviously in the last couple of years with the, the dedication towards the Ford motor, um, at times has been a real developing concept for them. And I'm sure there's been nights when he hasn't been where he wanted to be performance wise, because they were just deviating from that that path they've always followed but you, you're keeping an eye on the corner and going you know what maybe donnie's not at his best right now but i always know i can't turn my back on the on the ocean i never turn my back on the 15 <laughs> donnie uh you never let your guard down with donnie i know that donnie just didn't forget how to drive overnight so i know there's uh, obviously some you know learning going on with their engine development with you know just him gelling with uh his new crew chief and things like that but uh, no, we, we really try to stay focused on the 49, but you, you do have to, you know, obviously we're together with the racing against these people so much that you can't help but kind of recognize, you know, certain situations going on. But, um, you know, certainly when you're not on top, you're focused on, you know, what the, the top team is doing and, and trying to emulate it or try to do something better than it because that's, that's how you win. Uh, when you're on top, you know, one thing that we've learned is to really just stay focused on our race team. And, um, yeah. you know, the minute you start trying to chase something that someone else has figured out, uh, you know, it never really works for you. So, um, you know, definitely keeping an eye out for Donnie, uh, watching the younger guys come up, watching shark racing, but we know if we're, we're doing them our job, doing the best that we can, then uh, we still feel like we're the best team. Mate, just recently, the sport lost one of its greats, uh, one of its true great crew chiefs in Scott Gherkin, who um, for many, many people kind of was the guy after Carl. I mean, Carl Kinzer and Steve were just so incredibly dominant. Uh, and then, of course, with, with Mark as well. So when, when Scott came along, it was kind of like, wow, how do you follow up, you know, on someone like Carl? But Scott had a tremendous way of exerting his own impact on the sport and was so incredibly loved. The role of a crew chief is so pivotal and in your life as well, mate. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be kind of a, it was kind of a rough couple of weeks, to be honest, uh, losing Kenny Woodruff first. Uh, oh, yeah. Kenny a little bit, 
uh, you know, he's a, a, a generation maybe even before uh, Scott in a way. I mean, he was out there for a long time, but uh, I actually got to race, um, you know, against Scott when he was still out there with Steve and uh, got to know Scott and, and definitely uh, was just one of the good guys. Definitely caught me off guard. You know, I didn't, you know, hear of, of anything and then, you know, very unex unexpected. So uh, that was a tough one to swallow, but, um, you know, he was always one of the guys that you could go over to ask advice. Uh, he always was positive. Uh, and I, uh, actually he was the guy that gave me my 2019, uh, Kings Royal crown. So we had oh, a lot of a beer, you know, not that long ago. So it's definitely uh, a tough one, tough for the sprint car community. Uh, you know, obviously just prayers out for his, uh, his yeah. family, um, his daughters. And, you know, I know that, uh, it's, it's tough on everybody, but, um, you know, he'd want us to, mm -hmm. to keep racing. That's what he was a true racer. That you brought up the King's Royal. So, you know, whenever you bring up the King's Royal, I always ask you a question about a home improvement. What's going on with the swimming pool? Is it in yet or not? <laughs> yeah, the pool's not in yet. So, uh, we decided that the shop, I mean, maybe I decided, I'm not sure, but oh. the shop came in first. And uh, we, we have a lot of improvements coming going on at our house. But uh, the pool where we want to put it in our backyard is not the most ideal spot we're kind of back into a hill. So there'd be a lot of, uh, added work, but eventually we, we kind of have a five-year plan, uh, to kind of get the property. Wait, wait. yeah, go on. Yeah. My, my wife's not that pumped, but she's, you know, my daughter's only three, so she's, she's okay because I think we're, we're both kind of to the point that we want her to be able to swim, uh, before we actually have a pool, just to, to be on the safer side. And, and we both feel a little bit better about that, but uh, yeah, I've, I haven't uh, I haven't lived up to what I said I was going to for sure. So I, I do don't recall. That a lot. I, I do hear it a lot from a lot of different. Did you get the pool? Did you get the pool? And I shouldn't have probably opened my mouth, but we yes. haven't got the pool yet. But I do actually have a, you know, a design and a drawing and everything. It's ready to go. It's just uh, once I saw the price tag, we we might need to win another Kings Royal or two. <laughs> well, you you weren't on the podium. You didn't say. I can't wait to get a new shop. Like that's the thing, right? You, yeah. And you, you may have dropped an F-bomb or two. You were pretty excited as I recall. <laughs> um, so I'm just looking out for Mrs. Sweet here, you know, like you did make that call. Yeah. Honestly, I think I want the pool more than her, luckily for me. And she's, she's okay with waiting a year or two, but um, the shop is, you know, we have a lot of things that we, that need to be undercover. Uh, the championship car is taking a lot of space in the garage. So she's, she's excited to get some things out of the house and then out of storage. And uh, so it'll be good. I think the shop's a, a good thing for now. It'll be fun to kind of do that as a winter project since uh, there's not a lot else to do right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, normally I I'd be, I can't come over and see you. you I know. know right. I was just thinking that. It's, it's starting to hit me a little harder right now when I'm like, man, I don't really have a lot to look forward to right now besides chili bowl maybe in Volusia, you know, so. Yeah, I was thinking about that, mate. Normally, I'm in Mildura right now, which is only about three hours from your buddies in Broken Hill uh, as well. You know, the Ruse boys and Mama Ruse and, uh, you know, Mark Cooper in Sydney. And uh, so this is normally that time of the year. We're, we're getting ready for you to drink some cold beers and eat some pies. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and honestly, we got I got to give a shout out to the Ruse boys, Isaac and Josh and Mama Ruse are watching. I know they're uh, they're all having kids and, and building their families. Yeah. And Obviously, my boy Mark. Uh, I wish we could be, uh, you know, getting getting everything uh, prepared to go to go race uh, for another run in Sydney. But um, you know, obviously, the, it's just not not a uh, not looking that good right now. And of course, your teammate is uh, in a in a hotel room in Sydney, just pedaling on the treadmill uh, the whole time. James McFadden is in self quarantine, so uh, you know that kind of deal isn't as easy as it used to be. Yeah, I just actually just was on the phone with him asking him how to cook some fried rice up because me and him uh, were both into cooking. We got to know each other pretty good. It's been it's been really fun uh, getting to know James. And, uh, you know, we, we, we had a lot of fun drinking beer, uh, cooking and obviously racing together. So, uh, you know, I think it's it stinks for him that he's got to go through the 14 day quarantine thing. But, you know, he's a positive guy. He's getting through it good. And uh I get, I'm excited uh, for him to come back and race race again with us next year. Well, when you think about it, Brad, it started off, the season started off really well for both of you guys down in Florida. I think it was a one-two, wasn't it? Really early in the in the piece down there. And it was like, here we go. It's going to be the big cat and J-Mac year. And then, of course, 
it all just said pear shaped from there. But you had a great start to the season. And then mid season was where you struggled a little bit. Yeah, we had a good start. We had a lot of momentum from last year, you know, and, and this sport's built on momentum. Uh, we had some confidence. Uh, mid part of the season, we had some, we had three DNFs in a row. And, uh, you know, one of them was a couple of them were parts failures, a couple of them were just crazy accidents. And uh, it's crazy that it happened three nights in a row since that's kind of never happened to us. So yeah. and that's when I bring up adversity and, uh, you know, to overcome four total DNFs in a 50 race, 54 race schedule and still win the points, I think says a lot about how consistent we really were. Um, but, you know, there's always room for improvement. So we're going to, you know, we make sure that, that we look at what happened this year and, and, and try to, you know, make sure that our season's a lot stronger, you know, throughout the whole season next year. Cause I agree with you. We were way stronger through the first 20 or 30 races. And then uh, we didn't get a lot of wins in the second half of the season. And, you know, some of that was losing our confidence and some of that was, you know, uh, chasing the points at the very end of the season. Just, you know, you, you got to pick and choose your battles. And, uh, you know, that's uh, it's nice to get the points championship put away. And uh, next year we really want to go after some some wins. Seven wins from 19 races to start it all off. So it was like, hell yeah, here we go. And then yeah. it just, just a couple of those situations that you said. Now, when you had those DNFs, Donnie and Logan had – trouble around a similar time as well so that's the stuff you can't script that's just like that's the universe at times you go oh thank goodness that donnie didn't go on a mission in that time yeah yeah absolutely i mean the, the door was open uh you know had it been any other year i think donnie shots would have won the points by you know 500 <laughs> so the fact that we were able to to, to hold them all off i think we kind of know as a race team you know we're not gonna act uh you know dumb to the fact that that they had an off year and you know we, we obviously know that we need to be better. And obviously if it's an 80 race schedule, it'd be a whole different scenario too. So uh, it was just one of those years that you're happy to win. It just wasn't what it normally is. And it was the same for everybody. And we're, we, we still came out on top. So we're happy. We're going to, you know, enjoy the moment. Uh, but we're just not really settled. We're not, we're not a, you know, it wasn't like last year where we felt like we, we climbed the mountain uh, we stayed on top this year, but but it was kind of a, a short mountain. And now we need to, uh, yeah. you know, next year we know that if everything get back, gets back to normal, that we're going to be have, have to be, you know, twice as good as we were this year. Yeah, and it's and it's overcoming that adversity too. You know, for you to to come off the back of that and and settle the ship um, is probably the mark of of a great team. And also your maturity as a driver too, Brad, because it'd be easy to get rattled and go, oh shit, making mistakes here. And then losing that momentum that you really difficult to get back because confidence is a massive thing, isn't it? Absolutely. I think this confidence, momentum, you know, anything that's good in any other sport is the same in racing. And when you're winning, you know, you, you build confidence, you build momentum. When, you, when you're getting DNS, it goes the other way. You know, you start thinking, you start second guessing what you're doing. You start second guessing the yeah. people around you, the parts on the race car. You know, it's really easy to, to you know, make that a really big, you know, valley, you know, and you need everything to be, you know, the ups and downs seem to be very leveled out. You know, when you have a down night, you need to be able to recover quick. So three in a row definitely was tough on us, but I think having the championship the year before uh, was one of those things that just built so much into our race team as far as just, you know, confidence and, you know, we already have a championship. We know how to do this. If we just stick to what we're doing, you know, what we'll, we'll either get it or we won't, but we, we just don't, we weren't stressed. You know, we were a lot more, a lot more even keel and, and definitely confident. Brad, is it, is it an unfair thing to say that sometimes teams and drivers have to learn to win? Like once you get that understanding of, hey, I can do this, not just once, but twice. And my, my mindset changes that you can learn to win. Is that unfair to say? No, that's definitely not unfair to say. I think that's where the saying, you know, the first one's always the hardest, you know, comes into play. And I think that's the same with championships. It's, you know, just a bigger version of winning. I mean, uh, a mindset and confidence and people, just their positivity that it takes to run an outlaw tour. Uh, you know, I definitely didn't possess these skills my first, second, third, fourth year, you know, they developed over time. And, and now I'm in a position with a great race team that I feel like we could make a run, you know, at multiple championships, you know, we weren't there before. So, uh, you know, obviously I didn't say that before I had a championship, you got to get one or two of these things before you can kind of have that confidence. And I feel like, 
you know, basically we're, we're there now and, you know, Eric and me are just getting better. You know, Casey's giving us great, great stuff, you know, Joe and, and Andrew, uh, my other two guys are, you know, we're going on year three together, you know, all together as a full team. So, you know, there, there's a lot to be said about that. And, um, you know, we just, we're building a notebook, we're building confidence. I'm getting better as a race car driver. You know, I'm not, I'm not to that point where I'm, you know, thinking about other things. All I'm thinking about is winning championships, winning Knoxville nationals, winning Kings Royals, winning the national open, you know, uh, winning more Jackson nationals, you know, and everything that's, that's building up, you know, the, uh, it's, it's just nice to be a part of the sport right now because it's only getting bigger. It's interesting when you said about having to focus on the championship, when you had that, that stumble period uh, there where you're like, well, what are we doing here? And you had to go back to racing for the championship. Some guy in that 57 car didn't have to worry about a championship this year. He could just come in and just run that thing up in the bleachers if he, if he had to, to get the good line. That is also the difference, not to take away anything for what Kyle said, a phenomenal year. But he didn't ever have to think, where am I going to be in the points after I show up tonight? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, there was times at the end of the season that, you know, uh, Kokomo is a good example. I could have, I could have felt like I could have easily contended for the win or I tried to run at least a lot closer with Sheldon. Uh, but I just chose to run, you know, third or fourth there because I felt like risk versus reward just wasn't there. You know, there was just times that you, that you got to get a finish. And, and at the end of the day, the points were such a big deal at that point because everything else had gone wrong. You know, as far as we didn't get as many wins as we wanted, we didn't get a full season you know, and, and we were going to get the, the full championship money. And obviously you want to be a two-time champion. So, you know, those just things that you, you choose on the racetrack for risk versus reward. Obviously Kyle's just an unreal talent. And I think if he was to run a full outlaw tour, he'd be awful hard to beat in a championship and he would, and a lot of wins. Um, that's just his driving style though. That's how he's always driven. Um, you know, he's the guy that can run it on the ragged edge and wreck way less than than other guys that run it on the ragged edge. There's other guys that can run his pace. They just can't do it night in and night out and without wrecking. You know, I think Donnie's the guy that, you know, basically he can run that pace, but in a different line, you know, and he, and when he runs the middle and runs the bottom and runs those different lines that he's, you know, you know, mastered over the years, he just eliminates a lot of the risk factor. And, um, you know, Kyle makes speed wherever he has to make speed. He's just a, a very adaptable driver. So he'll bounce off the wall for 30 straight laps. Or, you know, when you watch him in a stock car for 500 laps or 200 laps at home said, you know, this close to the wall and, and everybody's in awe. It's like, well, that's how he is on dirt every night. So, you know, he just can <laughs> make the speed a certain way. And that's just a, a God-given God talent that he has where, you know, other guys just got to work a little harder if we're going we're gonna to run with him. You know, um, Sheldon had a phenomenal year. Uh, again, his, his speed has always been brutal, as you know, um, but he's starting to learn to win as well. That you got to watch out for that NOSCAR every night. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is if you look at the world of outlaws right now, uh, it's, it's very competitive. Like, it's probably as competitive as uh, I've ever seen. Obviously, Donnie had such a stranglehold on it for so many years, especially when I've been out there, that – that you just basically everybody was running for second. Now I think yeah. uh, legit, you you don't know going into a season uh, for one who's going to be the champion and and for two who the top five in points are going to be. So yeah, obviously Sheldon is is finding that fine line of you know going the speed he knows he can do, but obviously reining that into where he can do that every night without without crashing and uh, started to figure out how to win the races, chilling with his crew chief. So uh, yeah, I, I was impressed with Sheldon. Uh, he had crazy speed at times this year um you know obviously gravel's going with a new team mm. uh, he's been good with every team he's ever been with uh so there's no reason to, to believe that he won't be you know super competitive i think carson in the 41 yeah. uh, is going to make carson you know he's going to have phil's knowledge and the 41 speed um i think every the way it all played out donnie's going to be getting better uh you bring rootsel into the, yeah. the equation and the roth car but what with all the way he's been doing things the last few years with the all-stars. So um, I just think like, you know, Logan's getting better. Jake's getting better. I just, I think it's going to be one of the most competitive, you know, fun years, uh, you know, as a spectator. And honestly, I'm, I'm just super pumped to, to get out there and, you know, I think, uh, you know, contend for another championship. During the year, Darren Pittman announced that, that it would be his final year out on the road full-time with a full-time focus on the outlaws. Darren's been a phenomenal ambassador for the sport and for his home state of Oklahoma. Him and Mandy and the girls have been a 
huge part of the fabric of the outlaws as well, Brad. Yeah, absolutely. Darren is a, was a good friend, great teammate. Um, you know, we, we always bounce ideas off each other, always, you know, talk throughout the season, always enjoy seeing him. So it'll definitely be, you know, a little different not seeing Darren Pittman around because he's been there my whole career on the world of outlaws. Yeah. And, uh, honestly, for as long as I can remember watching sprint cars, Darren Pittman's been around. So, yeah. uh, yeah, it'll be different, but yeah, just the absolute, you know, like you said, the, the true outlaw, like he's been there forever. His family's been on the road forever. You know, his mom and dad are there a lot. So, uh, he'll be, he'll be missed. Great career, uh, champion, you know, he's accomplished a lot. So, um, and done nothing wrong, you know, along the way, just all class along the way. So, uh, yeah, it's, it'll be, it'll be different. I, I hope we still see him around the racetrack. I, yeah. I don't know what he's going to do yet. Hasn't really said, but, uh, you know, nothing but respect for the, for the Pittmans and nothing but the, wishing them the best moving forward. So Brad, your second uh, outlaw championship win puts you in rare air. You're now one of only six people, which is remarkable to think that, that have won more than one championship. Of course, Steve, of course, Sammy, <clears throat> excuse me, of course, Mark, uh, throw in Donnie, who's been dominant. But also throw in Jason Myers. A lot of people tend to, you know, forget the hot foot has been, you know, phenomenal as well in that sense. So now you're the sixth. That's incredible. I would have thought there would have been more, but when you think about the dominant periods of all those drivers, it probably makes sense. Yeah. How how many have three? <laughs> I need to check those stats. Do yeah, you know that? I don't know either, but I wonder if next year, if we win another one, do we go to another another level? No. Honestly, you it is. It's, I got to pinch myself to, to I, I don't even think it's really registered with me that we're like yeah. our names in that, you know, in that group, because I was just such a big sprint car fan growing up, like Sammy Swindell and Steve Kinzer are just, you know, and even Mark Kinzer, you know, now Donnie and Myers, they were all just so far out of reach and out of touch with reality of, you know, what you thought you could accomplish, you know, yeah. uh, especially the older guys like Steve and Sammy and, and Mark Kinzer, like, that's like my childhood, you know, like Donnie was a little, you know, came a little later. I actually had, you know, had to start racing against him and seeing how good he was, you know, and, and racing against him a lot. But, uh, you know, just, it's kind of one of those things where I guess you just, you don't get to stop and think about that stuff till it's all over. I don't really, I don't really want to, you know, I want to, yeah. I just want to keep winning. I don't, I don't know that I really want to like be like, man, two, that's cool you know, this is it. I'm it, you know, I want to win 10. I want to win, you know, as many as I possibly can. And then when it's all said and done, I want to look back and say, we didn't, you know, we, we absolutely achieved as much as we possibly could. We, you know, we basically capitalized on the moment that we had in time. We had the right team, the right sponsor, you know, I worked hard to get to this point right now. And I just want to make, I just want every year, to capitalize on those moments. So this year was a little tough because I felt like it just wasn't, you know, it took the win out of my sale. There was no Kings Royal to win. There was no Knoxville national win. And those are things that just drive me as a race car driver. So it was, it was a little bit tough, um, you know, to stay motivated this year. So it gets me excited for next year. Um, you know, and, and obviously, you know, at the end of my career, I think I'll look at those types of things of like, well, you know, man, that's cool that we're on that same stat line as that guy or that guy. But yeah. at the end of the day, you know, you, in racing there, it's always about we won the championship and then the next day it's like, okay, so who's going to win next year, you know, and, and how close are these points? So you always <laughs> got to stay focused on that. Well, KKR is, is only the fourth team to have won three uh, championships. It just tells you how, how inclusive uh, that little group is. It's incredible to think, Matt, when you look back at the number of races that you contested, 647 starts. You still look like you're 22 to me. 58 uh, career wins. Let's talk about Knoxville, just in that Knoxville national side of things. You've been remarkably consistent at the nationals every year. You've had one DNF there. Yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things that, like I said, it's not, you don't think about it each year, but you, and you look back on some of the stats and even the Kings Royal too, you know, like the Knoxville nationals is, is you know, I felt like we, we've, you know, been close a few times, but hadn't been able to win. And then, you know, after you win it and I ran six the next year, I felt like I just was the biggest loser ever. So, you know, some of those things I know other drivers would never understand, but I was, you know, I, I would have been ecstatic to run six, you know, five, six years ago. And just, you know, once you get to that point, it's, it's, they're hard to lose and you, and you, you really stay motivated. So um, yeah, it's just, 
we're on a good run right now. We got, like I said, we got everything that we need, you know, and it's all coming to, you know, into place at the right time. Eric uh, got all his experiences with Donnie and Ricky and, you know, learned everything that he needed to learn. Well, while I was over here learning everything I needed, you know, and how to do a few different crew chiefs and a few different ideas and, you know, learned, you know, some things from this guy and from that time, learned some stuff with Casey, you know, we got Rob competitive to build our engines and we switched to massive chassis and it just kind of all came together for us. And then, yeah. uh, you know, we have Nap Auto Parts supporting us and, you know, it's just kind of like one of those things where um, there's, there's just such a human element in sprint car racing that, that you've got to have this experience and you can't buy it. You know, we finally got it that, that it gives us a lot of confidence that we're going to be able to keep, keep rocking and rolling. So Tisha is telling me it's only three people that have won three championships. So thank you for that, Tisha. That kind of makes sense when you think back to Sammy uh, and also Jason uh, in particular there as well. So, well, Sam, that, so Sammy, Steve, and Donnie would be the three. Yeah. Then I think that Mark and uh, Jason would have two. So. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And, and Steve and Donnie really, you know, that's what 30 between the two of them. So that's a, uh, that's pretty crazy to, to think about that. Donnie's been able to stay at this level for mm -hmm. as long as he has. Uh, that's pretty crazy. So Brad, your, your early stuff, you were phenomenal without a wing. I mean, I saw you win a main, I chose you over a Bill Cosby concert in Kentucky to go to Bloomington, Indiana, and you smoked them at Bloomington that night. It's incredible to think that the schedules never really line up, but geez, I'd love to see you run the Brandt Professional Agriculture Corn Belt Nationals at Knoxville one day. <laughs> yeah, you know, I love non-wing racing. I'm a huge fan of it. And uh, I think midgets are a little more on shorter tracks or a little something I, I still will dabble with. But I think my non-wing days are, uh, of traditional sprint cars are, are over. You know, there's, there's a little more bravery involved in it. And, uh, you know, and those guys, they, they work really hard to get their cars right too. So, you know, the, the going back and forth, it, you know, I know that I would go there with such a disadvantage that uh, it'd be really hard to run against those guys that have, that have honed their skills and, and their cars and everything. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm loving the world of outlaws and the having the wing over my head. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's where I'm going to be uh, until I retire. And then I think uh, I'll be a fan from that point on. Why is Knoxville so special to everyone, Brad? What, what, and forget the race per se, but what is it about the Knoxville Nationals? And, and even when you, we, you do the, the big gun bash as well, the Brownells uh, big gun bash in June each year, why is Knoxville so special? Ah, the Nationals. And, and I think the town embraces it. But, you know, it's just, it's the pinnacle of our sport. It's, if you ask 99% of the drivers, it means more than any championship. Uh, it's just our, I don't know. It's just one of those things when you go there, and the feeling of winning the Knoxville Nationals was the greatest feeling of my life. You know, obviously, aside from having my daughter and well played. my wife, uh, well played. Um, <laughs> it's just it's just an unreal feeling. You, you can run it through your head a million times, but it was just unreal. But I've had so many great memories in, in Knoxville, Iowa. It's just, I think the little town embracing it, uh, yeah. the seclusion away from the rest of the world. And it's just, it's our time to get everybody that's a sprint car racer together uh, and duke it out, but have fun along the way. And, and, you know, I think sprint car racing fans know how to have the most fun. It's um, when you drive down that main road, man, and the, and the big flag comes up and the big grandstand sort of looms up. Does, does that give you chills when you, and you still go, Hey, it's right there. So yeah, still to this day, when I roll into Knoxville, whether it's the June race or the Knoxville nationals, it's just, there's a, you know, just a, different type of feeling chills and and you know just crazy to me that that racetrack is just it's just hollow ground to us sprint car racers and uh you know they've done a great job just to keep building and building and it just seems like it's only getting bigger and bigger and uh you know obviously this year sucked not having it, it was a, the worst part of this year was not having an Oxford nationals i would have never dreamed to go through a year without it so um you know hopefully everything will get back to normal and we'll uh we'll get back there and, and contend, you know, for another Knoxville nationals. Cause it's definitely on my list to do is to, to get back to, to getting one of those again. And it would be a good one to win the 60th because there's a good chance it's going to be 200 K to win um, the lap leader idea. Um, someone could potentially win an extra 50 on top of, of that 150 already. So I uh, know that the team are working very hard on that. And if you want to sponsor a lap, 
I think it's $1,000 US a lap to sponsor. Please get in touch with Kendra and the team at Knoxville Raceway. So the 60th is going to be huge because, man, everyone's be, everyone will be jonesing. We missed it this year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I remember the 50th uh, with Sammy and Donnie, and uh, obviously that was huge. And that's when we went to the 50 laps. And then uh, obviously 68, 60th and, and the way Kendra's been – you know, building the event, uh, there's a lot of momentum there. So, um, I think I agree with you that, it, uh, you know, everybody having a year off can make it even more, yeah. uh, you know, everybody's got the itch to be there again. So I certainly am more excited than ever to be back or, you know, to have a Knoxville nationals again and never want to take it for granted either. Brad, there's a little bit of Australian on you every time you race. It's actually a little bit of Scottish Australian. It uh, usually sits right here. Uh, there's a, a P1 logo on all of your suits. It always looks pretty smart. I know that Mike is watching at the moment. Safety, Mike. Your gear always looks fantastic, mate, and I, and I know that you're safe. Yeah, absolutely. I got to give a shout-out to Safety Mike because he was uh, – he hounded me for a couple of years, and I and I just, you know, was happy with what I had at the time. Uh, but, you know, I'm glad that he, you know, persistently, you know, kind of wanted me to be a part of his team, and uh, I was able to switch to it this year and, and, uh, most comfortable suits by far best customer service. And, you know, even, even my daughter, Savannah got a little P1 suit. So, uh, you know, not the best, I, I really appreciate, you know, everything he did. And, um, I'm glad that I'm, I'm involved in, uh, with P1 for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed there was a, there was a, an international modeling sizing concept going on there, wasn't there? Because, they had we was one getting sized up in Australia or America to check the size with safety mic and everyone. How did that work? Yeah, so uh, James was the guy measuring me, but he's a uh, he. We first of all, we had probably a little too many beers to be measuring because the measurements <laughs> were not that good at first. But uh, anyway, we yeah, I got working with James and and uh, you know we we got the suits right this year and and honestly they were they were the no no lie the most comfortable suits i've ever worn so i'm uh, really looking forward to next year just to, to keep building on the comfort side of that and uh, i really appreciate it brad do you watch the races do you watch later on do you watch the coverage uh, on dirt vision and look back on, on things are there some you don't want to watch if you do or do you always get something from watching it yeah i always watch whether i i don't want to or or i had no involvement in the race i always want to watch to to maybe understand where we weren't as good or, or when I think, you know, you, you see it from your lens and then you always want to see it from another lens. And, you know, I think it's a huge, a uh, huge tool to use to, to, to try to get better. Yeah, absolutely. The guys at Dirt Vision did a phenomenal job, mate. I know that Johnny's the front man. He's the voice for it and does that amazing job as the announcer of the series, but you throw in Brian Dunlap and you Ross Weeses and the entire team behind the scenes for Dirt Vision. They were the only link to the world for the outlaws this year yeah absolutely it was it was uh they've done a good job i know it's grown and grown and grown and, and the coverage has got better and better and i've heard nothing but great things from you know all the people that watch it each and every night uh for me obviously to go back and watch i it's you know even getting ready to go out to qualify we have it on you know so it's just it's becoming you know a part of our nightly routine for sure um i know that you've asked been asked this question a million times but people still always want to ask it Please explain the big cat uh, situation. <laughs> um, buddy of mine, JR Todd, NHRA drag racer. Uh, we lived in the house together in probably 2009, a uh, good, good long time ago. I uh, was watching a show uh, called Fantasy Factory. Rob Deerdick, he's, he's hilarious. Uh, he was calling his cousin the big cat. So we actually just started as a joke calling each other the big cat back and forth. Like we just thought it was funny and whatever well he he kind of just started calling me all the time and then other friends caught on so you know it started amongst just a small group of friends that I was like the big cat and I don't really know why but uh it ended up sticking with me and then obviously once Johnny Gibson yells the big cat and then uh, now even my daughter calls me the big cat oh, does she yeah it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's hilarious but yeah it's a uh, we've come a long way so. Man, that's incredible. Um, congratulations, mate. Like, it was a phenomenal year. You had to dig really deep. Logan gave you plenty. Donnie gave you plenty. Sheldon was up there. Gravel was up there. Those guys were constantly nipping away. But, you know, Casey, huge thank you to Casey Kane. I know he's your boss, but for me as a sprint car fan, what Casey has done with coming back to the sport after his NASCAR time and investing so heavily in it, mate, and, and from, hey, from 
that flag right there to have <laughs> Jay Mack, the opportunity to give James McFadden. Man, you know, what would we do without Casey? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He's a he's a true ambassador to the sport. He's a very passionate, uh, you know, great car owner. Best car owner I could ever ask for. So uh, I'm I'm truly fortunate to be a part of that team for sure. Both him and Tony Stewart both started off their career on, on the dirt, went on to the, the the dizzy heights of NASCAR, but then came right back. The pendulum swang right back to where their true north is. So we've got to thank them. Mate, congratulations. What an amazing year. Um, you are a two-time champion looking for three, which will put you in a little group of three with a couple of other guys that are fairly handy as well, maybe four. Yeah. Well done. Enjoy the family time. And um, I'm sorry we don't get to see you in Australia, mate, but just be safe more than anything. Yeah, sorry to all the Australian fans that are watching, man. We, uh, I'll miss having a meat pie and a beer after the races. I'll miss uh, you know that final se- season at, sit- at the Parramatta yeah. Raceway. So. Hopefully you guys have a good season. Uh, happy holidays, and, and thanks for having me on. Always nice chatting with you, buddy. Good on you, mate. See you, big cat. Have a great night. Yeah. Thanks, pal. Always good to catch up with uh, Brad Sweet. What a class operator, isn't he? Just a fantastic guy and uh, one hell of a racer as well. I just want to remind everybody, no show next Wednesday night. It is Thanksgiving, and there's probably no more uh, significant time to do that than there is in 2020. So I, I hope that you all give thanks for uh, your continued health and, and your friends and your family, because at the end of the day, we're all very fortunate to love sprint cars like we do and late models and modifieds and street stocks and whatever you, you do, we all love the dirt, but it's the people that make it so special. If you get a chance, I'd love you to get around methanolmoonshinemerch.com, my friends in America, and pick up some of our new range of moonshine uh, wear, as effectively we call it, Methanol Moonshine Apparel. Have a wonderful week, everybody. It's been my pleasure, as always, catching up with you on Wednesday nights with Wade. Take a break next week. We'll be back the week after. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Good night. Be safe. And in Australia, too, be safe today because it's Thursday already here. See you, guys. Shine on.